So in this video, we're going to look at the key thinkers in conservatism and how you could possibly use them in, in a range of, of essays. Um, essays, again, can be set on common core themes, human nature, the state, society and the economy, but also on the tensions within the ideology. And for conservatism, in the table, it might look something like this, the, the kind of three strands. You've got one nation, conservatism, traditional conservatism, which in a previous video I've called authoritarian, but in the new syllabus, the two of them are the same, traditional stroke authoritarian, which would include the, the neoconservative strand of the new right. And then, if you like the cuckoo in the nest, the liberal new right, neoliberalism, the second um, wing of the new right and you can see the kind of tensions across two strands believe in human imperfection and it's the neoliberal strand who are essentially um, classical liberals um, so again this tab will be in the the powerpoint when i send it out to you okay so conservative key thinkers uh, hobbs burke oakshot noisic and Rand, and uh, we mentioned Disraeli as, as the other thinker. Okay, so, I mean, all these essays, you know, ideologies, the, the command phrases, to what extent, so to what extent do conservatives agree on human nature? Basically, is, is it, do they believe in human imperfection or, or rationalism? And, you know, to a large extent, excluding the neoliberals, the, the conservatives do agree on, on human nature. Um, and this would include, you know, Burke, you know, Hobbes and, and Oakeshott. Uh, and this new conservative and one nation strand would see humans as morally imperfect, driven by non-rational drives and instincts and, and uh, particularly authoritarian conservatives like Hobbes, or who draw on Hobbes, should I say, who would advocate for strong law and order. Um, we're psychologically imperfect, we're limited and dependent creatures drawn to the known and the familiar and the tried and tested. And you can mention Burke's emphasis on tradition and the accumulated wisdom of the past. Um, and again, there's a neoconservative emphasis on nationalism. Um, and people are drawn to people who are familiar with themselves, homogeneous society. And then we're intellectually imperfect. And, you know, this could be Oakeshott. You know, the politic world of politics is, is more complex than human nature or intellect is able to cope with. It's boundless and bottomless. So there's broad agreement on the traditional and one nation strand of human imperfection. However, and I just before we move on to however, I mean the implication of this human imperfection. You know, is this puts faith in tradition and the accumulated wisdom of the past, familiar with the tried and tested, you know, we like to know our place, um, it gives us security and it gives us freedom. Um, but in contrast to that, to a limited extent, clearly the neo the neoliberals um, do not agree with the idea of human imperfection, it's classical liberal belief in rational, self-interested individuals. We are not limited and dependent, and we have a pronounced capacity for, for self-reliance. So this is pretty much going to be broadly the pattern. The odd ones that are going to be the neoliberals. So that was uh, human nature. Um, second one, society. Again, to a large extent, um, traditional one nation um, thinkers see society as organic, as evolved over a long period, uh, the parts are interconnected. The analogy most often used is, is a human body, but you can think of it like an ecosystem where the parts are in balance. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. There's a natural hierarchy within society uh, who are gifted with natural authority. But within the organic society, there's a sense of noblesse oblige, the price of privilege, where those in positions of wealth, fortunate enough to be in positions of wealth and power, have to look after those less well off. Um, you know, Burke, Oakshire, and you know, Disraeli in there as well, who drew on this idea of noblesse oblige for one nation. However, to a limited extent, because Rand and Noisek, the line with classical liberalism, would see society as atomistic, composed of self 
self-reliant, self-interested individuals. There is no natural aristocracy. It's simply a meritocratic society. And those who best utilise their talents and abilities um, will go further. Um, the role of the state. Um, well, probably to a slightly larger extent, all would agree on the need for a state. So even Noisic, the minarchist, would suggest that you need to have a very, very minimal state to provide order and defence. And Hobbes would say you would need to provide it, um, to provide, again, security and law and order. And everyone else, you know, Burke and the um, British Rally would see that you, you know, the state emerges as part of the organic society. Um, however, there are significant differences. I mean, the most obvious one would be Hobbes and you say Noisic would say, you know, the state, particularly Hobbes, emerged from a contractual basis based on consent, whereas the um, traditional and one nation thinkers would say the state has emerged out of the organic um, society rather than on a contract. And it's, uh, not based on, if you like, the consent of the government. Um, furthermore, um, one nation and traditional would be much more pragmatic, if you like, about using the state to deliver qualified or limited social and economic intervention in the interests of social cohesion and order. And this willingness to use the state uh, to deliver this qualified social and economic intervention. You can say it's based on either elite self-interest, you know, the palace is not safe and the college is not happy, or a sense of noblesse oblige, um, or it could be a mixture of both. Um, whereas neoliberals, very wary of using the state, it needs to be a limited state, and they would be in favour of rolling back the state to its minimal functions of order and defence. And again, linking back to the previous one, the traditional one nation would see the state rulers as being a natural aristocracy, whereas the neoliberals would have a more meritocratic approach. Um, their views on the economy. Well, there is um, a large extent of agreement in the sense that they would all support um, capitalism and free markets. They're part of the organic society for the one nation wants uh, private property. They all agree on the importance of private property and the benefits it has, gives people a stake in society, promotes sound conservative values, promotes respect for, for law and order. Uh, you know, we mentioned how Burke was very keen on trade and what we now call capitalism as promoting manners and civilised society. And clearly the neoliberals are big supporters of Free market capitalism. However, there are some significant differences um, in their approach to the economy. For you know, Rand and Nizek and neoliberals in general, their support for free markets is, is absolute. It's dogmatic and it's very principled. And this neoliberal new right belief in you know market fundamentalism, the same way as people believe in religious fundamentalism, they believe in market fundamentalism, um, and this rejection of Keynesian economic intervention or the mixed economy. They want to roll back the state. The markets deliver fairness and prosperity, and you know, for neoconservatives, you know, they also provide uh, social discipline as well. Whereas the one nation and traditional approach to the economy is, is, is very, very different. I mean, they accept capitalism as part of the organic society, it emerged organically, it's related to accumulation and private property, which is very important to them as well. Um, but this emphasis on capitalism is not as strong as in neoliberalism, you know, it's balanced by a paternalistic. Um, noblesse oblige approach, which can offer support for some state intervention in the economy, including welfare provision, to ensure the health and happiness of the whole. So they take a pragmatic view towards the economy, um, even more so with, with European Christian democracy, for example, who believe in what we look at the social market. 
that the support for the free market, only insofar as it generates wealth to maintain social services, social stability. Um, the high profile that the market has had in, in conservatism is a, is a pretty recent development, you know, you could say from late 60s, um, 70s and, and the emergence of the new right, whereas for most of its existence, conservatism has been characterised by other aspects such as in tradition, even in perfection, organic society. So traditional conservatives do not place capitalism front and centre, it's simply another element and it's not the most important element. Social cohesion and order is the most important things and if that means you have to sacrifice some economic freedom, so be it. Whereas for the neoliberals, clearly the economy is front and centre along with individual sovereignty. Is conservatism pragmatic or is it principled? Uh, you know, pragmatism is, is behaviour shaped in accordance with you know, practical circumstances, whereas principle is dogmatic, uh, a fixed set of belief for ideological objectives. Again, for most of its existence, um, conservatism has been pragmatic, and you can pull in Israeli as well. You know, we, we are intellectually limited, the world is very complicated to understand, therefore traditional and one nation conservatives have been very suspicious of abstract ideas and systems and preferred to ground their ideas in tradition and experience and history and take a cautious, moderate and I would say pragmatic approach to the world you know, ensure that the cure is not worse than the disease, for example, the one nation tradition. And they would say, you know, prudent social reform is the best protection against you know, popular revolt or unrest, especially in Israeli's time and in the face of widening inequality. And, you know, Rab Butler's quote about how, you know, the welfare state was perfectly compatible with the one nation tradition. And there's this pragmatic concern to alleviate poverty in the interests of elite self-interest. The palace is not safe and the college is not happy. Um, one nation conservatives would also say that they are both pragmatic and principled um, in the sense that Social intervention and economic intervention reform is based on a principled moral ethical belief in the obligation of those in positions of wealth and power to help those who are less well off part of noblesse oblige. So there's a good story to tell on that side. Um, however, uh, neoliberal new right uh, would not see themselves as pragmatic. They're very dogmatic, uh, very principled. They believe in rationalism, dogmatic belief in economic liberty and the free market, you know, dogmatic belief in economic liberalism, you know, want to roll back the state. And, you know, the neoconservatives to a, to a large extent are quite dogmatic as well. You know, they think there's very Manichian approach to things. Everything is, is black and white. There are good states and bad states, good lifestyles, bad lifestyles. So in that sense, they are quite principled, quite dogmatic as well. Um, Again, a subtle point you could make if you're time at the end that the new right, of course, would argue that they were pragmatic in the sense that the old social democratic consensus simply wasn't working, it had failed and it was apparent by the 70s and therefore the neoliberal and the neoconservative response was a pragmatic response to the failed post-war economic settlement. It's just a, a kind of point you could make at the end. And fairly common one um, is to what extent is the new right compatible. So I suppose you're just talking about the authoritarian strand, the neoconservative and the, the neoliberal here. Um, well, to, a, to a, a, a very limited extent you'd say that they're compatible. Um, you know, the neoliberals, Noizic and Rand, draw on classical liberals, liberalism, the egoistical conservatism, atomism, self-reliance equality of opportunity and meritocracy, whereas the neoconservatives, Hobbes is really the only one you can put in there, you would say they draw on Hobbes. Um, they're based on traditional authoritarian pre disraeli conservatism, using human imperfection, um, organic society, an emphasis on dif discipline, authority, defence and nationalism. So there's several areas where they would look incompatible. However, um, they are united in, in some aspects. I mean, they all were united, certainly in their opposition 
they knew what they were against, the opposition to the post-war demo social democratic, modern liberal, one nation settlement, and in particular the welfare state and Keynesian economic management. So they were united in their opposition to that. Um, both argue for a strong but minimal state, um, just because authoritarian argue for a strong state. A strong state does not have to be a large state. They both argue for a strong uh, but minimal state, even if they would disagree on why. You know, neoliberals emphasise negative freedom, especially in terms of the free market and laissez-faire economics. Um, Neoconservatives would you know, equally oppose interventionist welfareism on, on moral grounds. Neoliberals would oppose it on economic grounds. And both could see the market economy as, as a source of social discipline. And of course, both look to the past, they are quite reactionary, to try and recreate this supposed golden age and the term of the statute of the Victorian values, um, you know, laissez-faire economics and public uh, and private morality. So you can say that there's a degrees of compatibility to some extent, uh, and there's degrees of incompatibility as well. So they are main conservative thinkers and some of the main essays that you may um, come across.